I would like to say that as we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I would like to begin by thanking McCurcher LLP for sponsoring our lecture series and ask Aaron Starr from McCurcher LLP to say a few words on behalf of the firm. Hi. <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Actually, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Jamie Lavallee as well. She's a good friend of mine for a number of years. So, but I'm I'm proud to be here. Um, I actually sat in your guys' spots back in 2011, 2010, 2009. So appreciate you know your professors and what you guys do because it's you know it'll be a number of years before you get to my position, but it goes by quick. Okay, so. Um, so anyways, I'm a partner with McCurcher. I practice in the corporate commercial area, but I do a lot of Indigenous and First Nations law issues. So McCurcher, I just wanted to mention, is proud of this partnership with the College of Law and, and um, the opportunity to play a part in providing, you know, uh, the uh, sponsorship for the lecture series. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and I'd like to thank uh, the College of Law for this partnership, and we'd like to thank uh, Professor Bell for providing your insight on these important topics, so. Is there a whoops? Yes. Oh, okay. There's a whoops. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's like, this is the last lecture. You think that we'd have this, like, like, um, well oiled. However, Aaron is new to this one because <laughs> we usually have his compatriot right there come and introduce. So he reads all the blue, and then uh, and then I and then I realize that it's my turn, right? So it's 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 called flip the page. <laughs> I swear he's a much better lawyer than he is like a MC, okay, and a much better hockey player. So anyway, thank you, Aaron. And Aaron Starr is actually from Star Blanket. When he mentioned, like, I've known him like for quite a while because my um, foster home that adopted me actually had his mother as one of the social workers. So, um, so we've known each other not just for years but decades. <laughs> okay. So in January 1979, again, look at the decades. Um, the late Ariel F. Sallows, QC of North Battleford, which does he still get to be QC or does he now have to be KC? I don't know, anyway, of North Battleford, Saskatchewan, signed a trust agreement ensuring the future established establishment of a chair funded from his estate. Now remember, everybody can do this. <laughs> okay, the Ariel F. Sallows Chair of Human Rights is the first endowed chair at the College of Law and the first endowed chair of human rights at any college of law in Canada. And that was only in 1979. So the chair called the Sallows Professor of Human Rights um, supports courses and research in human rights at both the undergraduate and graduate level. So recent chairholders include Professor Rachel Lowen Walker, Professor Paul Finkelman, and Senator Kim um, Pat. Pate? Pate? Okay. Uh, read. Um, but uh, this semester, we have been pleased to have um, Catherine Bell as the Ariel F. Sallows Chair in Human Rights at the College of Law here. And she is a professor emeriti of law at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on Indigenous constitutional rights, cultural heritage law, and Indigenous research ethics. Recent projects include the First Peoples, Coun uh, First Peoples Cultural Council of BC on repatriation and legislation impacting First Nations heritage, the Canadian Museums Association on application of UNDRIP to museum policy and practice, the Indigenous Heritage Circle on reforms to national heritage laws and policies, and developing collaborative projects globally as a member of the steering committee for the Intellectual Property and Cultural Heritage Project. Okay. So we see a theme, right? A lot of heritage law needs to be reformed. Okay, and um, finally, in 2012, Professor Bell was awarded the Raymond John Natitian Governor General's Gold Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Law and Legal Education in Canada. So therefore, please join me in welcoming Catherine Bell. Okay. Okay. And following Catherine's um, presentation, if there's time, we might have a Q&A, um, and then, but if not, we will wrap up. 
afterwards. Thank you. Okay, now I think we've covered it. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, it's been a long time since I have been in Treaty 6 territory, the homeland of the Métis, and here at the College of Law. Uh, it's a very special time for me because I actually went to high school here and did my university here, and that's me with uh, one of my best friends, uh, Bernie Beller, uh, when we graduated here in 1985. Uh, Bernie actually eventually became my brother-in-law, uh, and uh, sadly he is uh, passed on now. But uh, I remember him warmly uh, in my heart today as I'm here before you uh, talking about uh, some of the projects that I've been doing here at the Faculty of Law while I've been the Salos Chair. But before I begin, I want to thank the elders who have been working with me while I have been here. I have had the ongoing support of Joseph Netauhau, uh, Dr. Uh, Rose Roberts, Knowledge Keeper, and Maria Campbell. And without their support and guidance, I would not have been able to do my work. And I also want to acknowledge all of the elders that I've worked with over the last 35 years, uh, some who are here still and some who have passed on. Uh, there's also a number of other people I'd like to thank, including McCurcher for uh, sponsoring uh, this series, uh, Dr. Lavely for her friendship and sharing her expertise and collaborating with me, uh, many of you here in the faculty, and of course the students. Um, I have so thoroughly enjoyed uh, teaching you and working with you. Your energy and insights uh, have just been quite remarkable. And several of you volunteered uh, with me uh, at the workshop I'm going to talk about today. And uh, some are my research assistants, uh, Charlotte uh, McLaughlin, uh, Catherine Freena, David Werner. Uh, I will continue to work with them over the next year, although unfortunately not David, uh, who is happily uh, going on to the King's Bench. Uh, congratulations, David. Uh, but I will continue my collaborations with the College of Law. I actually first started working in the area of Indigenous rights here in 1982. Uh, as a student at uh, the Native Law Center, now the Indigenous Law Center. And I've continued my relationship with the Faculty of Law in a number of ways, including uh, with the what was then the uh, Native Law uh, program, property program, uh, doing research, and most recently up in Nunavut, uh, where I taught a course on uh, property law, native land claims, the Nunavut land claim, and Inuit law, a form of intersocietal property law, which relates a little bit to what I'm talking about today. What I'm going to focus on today are some of the projects that I've been working on as the Ariel Salos Chair, and I'm going to wind up with a couple of examples of heritage law reform. One is a, a reform process I'm currently involved in, and one is something that I and my collaborators are keeping a very close eye on for its potential, potential pardon me, implications for uh, jurisdiction over Indigenous heritage. I'm going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes uh, so that we have time for questions. So as I mentioned, I've been working in the area of uh, Indigenous heritage, but there actually is no um, single legal definition for Indigenous legal heritage. It's defined according to specific instruments and statutes uh, internationally and nationally. So for example, it will have one definition in the context of cultural property export and import. It will have another definition in the context of provincial heritage law. It will have another definition in the context of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I'm going to be talking about today and which I'm going to refer to as UNDRIP. When we think about Indigenous heritage from uh, an Indigenous perspective, however, it's much more holistic. And the definition that I have up here today is one that was developed after national collaborations with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people across Canada uh, by the Indigenous Heritage Circle. The Indigenous Heritage Circle is a national organization formed by Indigenous people and led by Indigenous people that is aimed at promoting increased control and jurisdiction over Indigenous heritage as well as education. And I happen to be a member uh, of, of that board. So when we talk about uh, Indigenous concepts of heritage, it's really important to understand that they don't always fit neatly into our property law constructs and frameworks. 
Canadian property law divides property into intellectual property, land, uh, movable objects, we talk about ownership. These concepts don't necessarily jive with Indigenous relations to their heritage. Having said that, there are many significant and dated laws that tend to uh, impair and create barriers for Indigenous peoples to uh, exercise their heritage, to be reconnected to their significant cultural belongings, and to bring their ancestors home. This legislation, quite frankly, goes back to the 1970s, before the recognition of Indigenous rights in the Canadian Constitution, before the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, before the inquiries into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, before the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Uh, Dr. Thomason Playford really brought this uh, point home at some meetings we had a few weeks ago, referring to some of the music that was going on back then. I think the hit was, you know, staying alive, right? So it gives you a sense of how incredibly dated this legislation is. Uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. My focus is going to be on archaeological heritage and in specifically belongings, and I will be referring a bit to ancestors and to the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. I have collaborated with, largely with First Nations in this work for about 35 years, and a very strong message that they bring and that I'm obliged to say and want to say is that this is much more than a legal uh, issue. This is much more than an issue of academics. This is deeply personal and spiritual to many of the people that I work with. And it's really important that we not lose uh, sight of that. And I won't be talking about ancestors a lot for that reason. Uh, and some of what I do is triggering work. So I, I wanted to draw your attention uh, to that before I begin. So the first project that I want to speak to you about was the National Trust Conferences, which were held in uh, Toronto in the fall of 222. These conferences brought together heritage workers from across Canada. There were about 1,500 or so folks there. The Indigenous uh, Heritage Circle partnered with National Trust in order to try and shift thinking about heritage away from just places and sites and to raise issues of Indigenous peoples in relation to their heritage as well as how UNDRIP could be activated within the heritage sector. Although there has been research gone, going on in the area of law reform for some time, it really just got sped up with the release of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Canada's formal commitment to the United Nations Declaration. As this work was going on, the Indigenous Heritage Circle thought it was very important that we get the views of Indigenous experts in the area of heritage and law with respect to their views how UNDRIP should be activated in the context of heritage. There were many recommendations that came out of the report. I oversaw the report, helped develop the research questions and helped deliver it uh, through various sessions at the conference in the fall. Some of the recommendations that came out of that report were to review essentially all the law that implicates uh, heritage. My focus right now is on, as I say, heritage conservation legislation and archeological heritage. The second project that I was involved with here as a Salos Chair in Human Rights was interventions with respect to Bill C-32. This bill is going to replace the current uh, National Historic Sites and Monuments Act. That is the legislation which creates and designates and recognizes national historic sites like Wanuskewin outside of uh, Saskatoon, Head Smashed and Buffalo Jump, a number of other historic sites. When this legislation was put forward, there were various concerns in the heritage sector. It has many, many uh, positive aspects to it, and it's intended to uh, respond in part to Call to Action 79, which I've got on the slide here before you, and in particular, the first and second aspects of the Call to Action, representation on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board, as well as um, greater respect for Indigenous knowledge and laws in the designation of sites. When we reviewed this legislation, we were very concerned because there was no express reference to the Declaration, 
and um, it affects all sites on federal lands. There's no mechanism in it for joint decision making or consultation with First Nations other than appointments to the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. So um, I drafted some interventions with respect to the declaration. Uh, the legislation is now in second reading and I'm happy to say that they are now saying it needs to be reviewed in light of the declaration. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, but the process was very different from some of the collaborative processes that I'm gonna to talk to you about at the end of my lecture, which are much more in keeping with the processes that are anticipated by the United Nations Declaration. So this is a very positive step, but there are some problems with it, and I continue to be uh, engaged in this process. Another project uh, that I completed up while I was here is the companion resource report to move to action, which is the report of the Canadian Museums Association uh, responding to the declaration and how it should be activated within the museum sector. I was uh, honored to be on the Reconciliation Council for the Canadian Museum of Association for a few years and continued to collaborate with them on a report that focuses on how the declaration applies in the context of heritage and specifically in the context of museums and galleries. The uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission of Canada has really emphasized the relationship between uh, cultural heritage and um, between revitalization of Indigenous communities as well as the genocidal acts that were committed upon and perpetra perpetrated on Indigenous communities uh, in Canada. Uh, this quote is particularly uh, telling um, and I will just uh, read it from my laptop over here which says, I guess I won't, I'll, I'll read it this way. <laughs> the residential school system, separation of individuals from families and families from communities, dismantling of legal, educational, and spiritual institutions such as the Sundance and Thirst Dance on the prairies and the potlatch on the west coast was part of a broader and oppressive federal policy in the words of the TRC to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties through a process of assimilation and cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. I don't think you can find a stronger statement than that. And this echoes in the findings of the Kikatani Truth Commission, uh, which is an Inuit uh, uh, commission, as well as the uh, calls to justice of the uh, murdered and missing um, uh, the inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous uh, women and girls. So there are several calls to action that speak to the need uh, for museums uh, and other uh, institutions with heritage mandates to take responsibility, uh, especially if they are publicly funded, uh, to reconnect objects and to actually go through their entire policies of governance uh, in relation to what it means to activate UNDRIP uh, with respect to their collections. So this takes me to the uh, next project. All of this, of course, is speaking to the need for change, speaking for the need to uh, change relationships and bring cultural belongings uh, back to communities, to uh, bring ancestors uh, home, uh, to be reunited with their communities and their proper places, as well as to uh, look closely at the barriers that are created by existing legislation. While I was here and with the support of the Salos Chair, uh, I brought together uh, 43 students, uh, experts uh, in Indigenous law, uh, in Canadian law, in heritage, uh, and in archaeology, and across generations and sectors to explore some of these issues out at uh, Wanuskewin. So um, there were a number of different topics that we explored. Here I want to acknowledge uh, Joseph Netauhau, who collaborated with me and walked very closely with me in designing this program. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Jamie Lavely uh, for her contributions. 
I also collaborated with Karen Aird, who is the Heritage Manager from First Peoples Cultural Council, with Keisha Supernant, who is the Director of the uh, Institute for Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta, as well as the President of the Indigenous Heritage Circle, and Brenda Gunn, who is a professor from Manitoba and currently with the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. They inform some of the topics and uh, some of the research that we did leading up to the workshop. There were several themes uh, that emerged from uh, this workshop. One of the dominant themes uh, that uh, resonated throughout this workshop and that has resonated throughout all of the work that I have done is the importance of ceremony, protocol, and indigenous law to everything uh, that we do. Uh, we were very blessed uh, to begin with a pipe ceremony uh, to seek the support of our ancestors and to ensure that we were following proper protocols uh, before we began. And through this process and continuing to work with me are a number of elders. In particular, I want to acknowledge Joseph and Rose and also Wabdi, Wakita, and Pahapitswin, uh, who are both elders who came from Manitoba uh, and supported us uh, throughout our talks. So um, one of the themes, I'm just going to go to my notes here for a second. You know what, better yet, I'm going to take the mic out of the stand, and then I'm going to be able to see my slides. How's that? If I can. Yes, I can. There you go. Now I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> so um, the second theme that uh, emerged from the workshop was that it's fundamental to any uh, work impacting Indigenous heritage. Uh, is the need to respect Indigenous law, jurisdiction, and participation in decision-making. This point was uh, brought home strongly by the former uh, Treaty Commissioner, Harry LaFond, who said a necessary aspect of decolonization is realizing that there is a significant difference between doing things uh, for people and walking with them. And this speaks very much to uh, the respect for treaty jurisdiction, another point I'll come to at the end of my talk. First Nations have consistently uh, insisted that the treaty relationship is not one in which there was any surrendering of land or jurisdiction, but was one that was intended to cement a partnership which people often referred to as treaty federalism, walking side by side and sharing jurisdiction and figuring out how to resolve conflict when those conflicts arise. And this is a point that I'm gonna come back to when I talk about Bill C-92. Another theme that emerged from our workshop was that the declaration is aimed at enhancing harmonious and cooperative relations based on principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, and good faith. Throughout the United Nations Declaration, there is reference to the right to participate in decision-making in matters that affect their rights through their own representative institutions and decision-making institutions. And that indeed what indigenous rights are going to look like when we enter into this process is gonna be different in every different context. It's going to look different in the context of BC's Heritage Conservation Act than it is in the National Historic Sites and Monuments Act. But it's something that is to be negotiated through cooperation, mutual respect, collaboration, and good faith dialogue aimed at consensus. Now this is very different than the constitutional duty to consult, which starts from the presumption that the Crown makes the decision and then engages and consults with Indigenous peoples and may accommodate depending upon the strength of the right uh, and the impact on that right. Uh, this starts from a position of equality and negotiating towards consent. In the area of consultation, there may be accommodation for sure, but that accommodation could be a regulation that is imposed by the government. It's not necessarily something that is achieved through a consent-based process. Now, Canada has committed to a consent-based process. It has recognized that its principles of engagement with Indigenous peoples go beyond the Section 35 duty to consult. 
and they've articulated this in principles that they published in 218. They've also articulated this in legislation that they have enacted to implement uh, the Declaration. Two other themes emerging from the work that we did at the workshop is returning cultural belongings is important to living peoples and traditions and for indigenous nation building. And second, ancestors are not archeological objects. Descendant communities have ongoing relationships and responsibilities to ensure the proper protocols are followed for their care and to welcome them back to their rightful place. There are many articles in the United Nations Declaration that speak to Indigenous heritage. And in fact, the Declaration as a whole speaks to the broad concept of heritage. But there are specific articles that speak to certain forms of heritage. And these articles affirm that Indigenous people suffer violations to the rights of religion, culture, spirituality, education, and traditional knowledge when their items, ancestral remains, and intangible heritage are improperly acquired, used, and kept by others, which is currently the case in Canada. So these are just some of the specific sections of the Declaration that speak to Indigenous heritage. The two that are very much engaged with the work that I am doing right now are Articles 11 and 12, which speak to the uh, right to culture, including the right to restitution of property that has been taken in violation of Indigenous laws and without their free prior informed consent, as well as right uh, to spiritual and religious traditions, including the right of repatriation, as well as Article 25, the right to spiritual relationships with traditional lands and resources. So in our uh, conference, we talked a lot about repatriation, which occurs in Canada largely through policy frameworks. However, currently there are only seven uh, publicly accessible uh, policies that are available uh, by heritage institutions and actually only three universities have publicly accessible uh, information uh, with respect to uh, repatriation. And despite an increased willingness uh, of institutions to develop policies to return, and there's a wonderful example a couple of weeks ago, of course, of the return of the saddle and pipe uh, to uh, Poundmaker uh, First Nation through uh, collaborative efforts, but despite these efforts, there continue to be significant barriers. Uh, it's, it's beyond the scope of my talk today to talk about all of them, but a few of them are the costs that are borne by First Nations and by museums, the fact that the onus is on First Nations to find where this information is, uh, the fact that in many institutions, the records are incomplete and they don't know uh, what uh, communities are connected to much of what is in their collections, uh, very narrow policies that focus on sacred and ceremonial artifacts and don't speak, for example, to intangible heritage like recordings uh, and photographs. Uh, and uh, all of the power is, is with the holding institutions in the event that negotiations break down and there is no form of dispute resolution uh, that mandates consideration of Indigenous law and protocol uh, with respect to validity of title, to name a few. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, lots, there's, lots of, there's lots of problems. Uh, some people spoke to the need uh, for law reform to address these issues. Other people really emphasized the importance of uh, institutions uh, taking on their ethical obligations with respect uh, to uh, the property and ancestors that are within their control. We also talked about the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, and I see there's a typo here, but protection is important because it does speak to protection. Uh, in the United States, for example, the obligation is on publicly funded institutions to go through their collections, to identify uh, uh, descendant communities and people with cultural affiliation and to notify them about what is in their collections. Uh, there's also provisions in the United States law that say when we're talking about cultural patrimony, when we're talking about uh, items that are owned collectively, it's the law of the Native American tribe, and that's the language they use there, that designates whether or not that can be sold. And then 
Canadian law clicks in. So, for example, if collective property is sold contrary to the law of a community, the Canadian common law principle, you can't sell what you don't have, clicks in, and there's no valid title, okay? That is not the case here in Canada today. The next uh, theme uh, that came out of the conference, and I should say I'm just starting to think about this. We just held this event last week. <laughs> So I'm just starting to think about uh, what I heard and how it relates to the work ahead of me and the work that has brought me uh, to this place today. But the sixth theme uh, is there is a need to change law that impacts Indigenous archaeological heritage that fails to respect Indigenous rights and separates Indigenous peoples from their ancestors and their significant cultural belongings. And this point was really brought home by uh, Dr. Keisha, Keisha Supernaut from the University of Alberta when she said, uh, when I'm working out in the field, the law says I have to move my ancestors to a museum, a government repository to incarceration, instead of working with descendant communities to determine how their relations should be properly cared for. Now, at this point, I should say that there is a difference between law and practice, and that's another reason why we need law reform. There has been significant evolution in professional ethics with respect to archaeology. And in most provinces, particularly when we're talking about ancestral remains, there is some kind of engagement with community with respect to protocol and with respect to reinternment. However, there continues to be excessively discriminatory treatment in the assumption that communities do not have ongoing relationship or responsibility and that there is a presumption of the public good of scientific investigation. You know, as Jamie said, you know, what public and who's good, right? These are very important questions uh, that we need to ask when we're talking about reform. And that's not to say scientific investigation isn't important. And indeed, many First Nations support it, but only when ancestors are cared for properly, and only when proper protocol is followed, and only when they're engaged in the process, and only when it's appropriate, <laughs> okay? So um, none of that is within our current legal structure, unlike, for example, in the United States. So this then takes me to some of the heritage law reform that I'm going to talk about and wind up with. Every province has some form of provincial heritage conservation legislation. And it's designed to protect what they define within their different jurisdiction as heritage objects uh, and heritage sites. And in almost all provinces, there's a few exceptions, what we call archeological heritage is vested in the crown. So any objects that are on or under the ground become crown property, and it doesn't matter if it's private or public land. Again, there's a few exceptions in Eastern Ontario. This is the case largely in the West. And although it's called heritage conservation legislation, although in Saskatchewan it's heritage Property Act, that's got to change. The word property is not appropriate in speaking about belongings and ancestral remains. There's lots about that act uh, that, that, that need to change. Um, uh, although the idea is to protect, rarely is that the case. Rarely the focus is on the permitting process and what conditions are to be imposed in those permits. And there is no obligation to consul consult with Indigenous peoples when 99.9% .9 of what we're talking about are indigenous archaeological artifacts, and often we're talking about burial sites. Uh, there also is no mandated duty to consult. Now, this takes me to an issue that I'm just starting to explore. Uh, so are some leading folks like uh, John Burroughs and Kent McNeil, and that is the coexistence of indigenous rights with private property. One of the problems in treaty territory is that governments assume that indigenous rights no longer, indigenous people no longer have rights in relation to private property. And um, there is case law that suggests, and it's very limited, uh, that there can be rights. For example, in Treaty 8, there's the right to hunt on private property uh, if that property is not um, obviously occupied. Uh, there are ways to think about property rights coexisting in a way that we can respect private rights and indigenous rights. And when I talk about private property, I want to emphasize 
and I've been doing this work for a long time, 35 plus years, none of the First Nations that I've worked with are interested in impairing private property rights. It's only when it's a very significant issue. What they are interested in is access to ceremonial sites in respectful treatment and removal of their property to access those sites and a number of different things that I will come back to. But private property is a really important issue and it's one of the issues I'll be delving into with the First Peoples Cultural Council when I return to British Columbia. So let me just conclude then talking about the two heritage law reform projects. Uh, one I am currently involved in and that it's ongoing. The second that I'm keeping a very close eye on uh, along with others for its potential implications for ind indigenous jurisdiction over heritage. The first project relates to the BC Heritage Conservation Act. It's a little bit different from some of the other provincial legislation. And that's because in 1990, there were some engagements with First Nations in BC. This resulted from uh, decisions recognizing Aboriginal title in BC. Uh, it resulted from the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act being enacted in the United States and also a change in government. After that consultation process occurred, there were some changes to the legislation, one of them being it's silent on ownership. Now this is something that they're calling to change because um, the silence on ownership is respectful to the notion that indigenous peoples assert ownership of heritage within their traditional lands. However, the problem that has arisen is if something is wrongfully removed, once we start getting into litigating who has the best rights, we have a co competition between the common law of property and Indigenous rights law, which can be very expensive litigation. So people are calling for the recognition of Indigenous rights and ownership within the legislative framework now in a way that um, the government wasn't willing to listen to before, but now is because of the United Nations Declaration. There's also a very limited uh, duty to consult uh, with respect to certain um, archeological heritage and sites that uh, predate 1846. This is the date that the border between the US and Canada was established, 1846. Now, First Nations in BC um, are trying to argue and will likely be successful in getting this date distinction removed because of course there are many significant sites uh, post-1846 as well that they would like to see have automatic protection without it having to be designated uh, by the provincial government. So one of the things that has led to significant reform in the process that I'm involved in now in British Columbia was the dispute over Grace Islet, which some of you may be familiar with. Grace Islet is a little islet off of Salt Spring Island that was bought by a very wealthy uh, business owner from Edmonton uh, for his retirement home. At the time he bought it, uh, he knew that there was archeological, um, there was an archeological site there, but he wasn't, uh, I believe familiar with the extent of the burials that were located uh, on that site. When he retired, uh, he made the appropriate applications to the archeological branch to get a permit to do the excavations that were necessary uh, to build his home. He started building the home and he built them over top of burial cairns. The First Nations in that area have been visiting that island for many, many years to care for their ancestors and to do ceremony. This led in to incredible uh, public outrage uh, by First Nations as well as by the general public, not only in British Columbia, but across Canada. And indeed, it led to the filing of one of the first claims to Aboriginal title against private land. Ultimately, that did not have to go uh, to the courts uh, uh, what happened is funding was obtained to purchase this island and turn it into the park. And I can tell you that this very wealthy person left much, 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 much more wealthier uh, after he was paid out uh, for this island. And that's the kind of thing, of course, that we want to avoid. The problems both for the First Nations, whose rights are being ignored and sites are being desecrated, and also the challenges for private landowners who, quite frankly, have no way to know the significance of sites 
on the titles because the registries are dated, because they're underfunded, and you cannot register an indigenous interest against uh, a land title. And so this is another reason why uh, we are looking to find uh, statutory recognition of interest, it doesn't necessarily have to be ownership, so that they can be registered against title and give owners notification uh, when uh, properties are sold. So in British Columbia, they do have legislation that um, implements the declaration and it specifically talks to the ability of joint statutory decision uh, making. So this is the process that is underway right now. It is a uh, three-stage process that will eventually lead to recommendations for law reform. We are in the process of stage one, which is where we are identifying alignment issues with the United Nations Declaration and bringing all of the concerns forward that we're hoping to address through amendments to the legislation. When I say we, I've participated in this on behalf of the Indigenous Heritage Circle and the First Peoples Cultural Council, uh, but it is a collaborative process, and this process itself, very importantly, was designed in collaboration with the First Nations of BC. It's gonna be a slow process, but note that legislation isn't even introduced until all of the engagement happens and until decisions are made with respect to what kinds of reforms need to be done. Uh, some of what was said, uh, there's no process for shared decision making, uh, there's no recognition of First Nation uh, rights of access, uh, there's no mechanism for dispute resolution, uh, there's issues around ancestral burial sites not following protocol, desecrating uh, burial sites, too narrow in the scope of protection. I see I'm getting a bit short of time, so I'm just gonna um, say a couple of words of private lands and then uh, finish up with the uh, last example so we have some time for questions. There are a number of pragmatic concerns with respect to private lands. There's a real disincentive on private owners to report because they bear the costs. They bear the costs of all of the work that needs to be done. So we need to look at this issue of cost and who bears the costs. Uh, I mentioned before there's no effective mechanism of notification to purchasers. Uh, there's a disincentive on the government uh, to enforce on private lands as well because a lot of the terms in the legislation, for example, are vague, like what is meant by desecration. It's not defined. Uh, they also have limited resources to enforce and monitor, and First Nations want to uh, participate in that process. So there has been an agreement entered that everybody's keeping their eye on. It is an agreement with the Stalo Nation in which there is a joint decision-making process. They have their own process for determining uh, what conditions should be put into permits. Then they engage with the province. If there's disagreement, the province loops back. Uh, and if a permit is issued, there is a right to judicial review, but the First Nation has to be involved in that process. So this is new, it's a one-year pilot project. We'll see uh, what, what happens as a consequence. Where I want to finish up with then in my last few minutes is to talk about uh, Bill C-92. This is what I'm keeping a very close eye on. Bill C-92 is a bill which recognizes inherent First Nations jurisdiction with respect to child and family uh, social services. And it's a bill which, um, if agreements are entered into between the province and the federal government and First Nations, will elevate First Nation law over federal and provincial law in the event of a conflict, okay? So there's provisions in there that say indigenous law is gonna be dominant in certain areas. However, this is being challenged by uh, the Quebec government uh, and is on uh, appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. I don't have time to go into all the details of this legislation, but let me just talk about a couple of its potential applications to heritage. And I apologize for the details of these slides. I just sort of plopped them out of a classroom slide and plopped them <laughs> into this one so that I would remember a little bit about what I wanted to uh, talk about uh, today. One of the first points they said is that the federal government has jurisdiction over the well-being of indigenous peoples and their interpersonal relationships. Uh, on this broad reading of uh, jurisdiction, uh, one can certainly argue 
uh, that the federal government has some jurisdiction in relation to indigenous heritage. And the court made it very clear that it didn't matter that there aren't existing cases with respect to this, uh, that in fact it is an obligation of governments uh, to negotiate the content of Section 35, and that was anticipated in the Section 37 constitutional conferences. They just were not uh, successful. So there's nothing preventing the federal government from enacting legislation with respect to heritage sites on federal lands. If it starts to interfere with uh, private property rights and provincial rights, uh, there may be some issues there that we have to work through if those parties aren't involved in the process. A second thing that the court said was that this right to uh, self-government over family and child uh, services is very much connected to the fact that it's intimately tied to their culture, continuity, and survival. Well, we can certainly make that argument <laughs> with respect to many forms of indigenous heritage. There is absolutely no doubt about the connectivity and importance of heritage uh, to indigenous well-being, and we have numerous commissions uh, that uh, speak to that point. And what I want to leave you with is uh, what it says about treaty, because this is very important being here in treaty territory. The Quebec Court of Appeal affirms First Nations understandings of treaty federalism and their relationship with governments and recognizes that there are indeed three orders of government in Canada and that the treaties did not terminate indigenous uh, jurisdiction or decision-making authority. Uh, now, again, when laws conflict, it needs, they need to be negotiated. And one thing the Court of Appeal of Quebec said is the mechanism to do that is the justification test in Section 35. It's a, it's a standard in which the court, uh, sorry, the government must show that ha it has a compelling public purpose uh, and substantial public purpose, that it has complied with it, its honor. That means minimal impact that it has engaged with its duty to consult, and indeed in the area, era we are in now, it is engaged in a consensus-making process. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, that is 10 to 1 and gives us a little bit of time uh, for questions, but uh, I want you to know that my time here has really been outstanding. I have really appreciated the support of everybody that I have worked with. Uh, I have friends and family online, including my mom. Hi, mom. I love you. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're laughing because I said I was going to retire, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, I have retired from the University of Alberta. But as you can see, this is a really exciting time. And it's not the time for me to stop. So I'm going to keep going. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to pose to Professor Bell? No? We're just... Oh, okay. So state your name and or your, and your affiliation. Thanks, Jamie. It's Heather Haven. Um, I'm, a, I'm a faculty member here at the College of Law. This, this is really interesting, and um, just so first of all, just really on behalf of the college, thank you for being here, and thanks for um, you know giving this wonderful opportunity to the students and to uh, to the rest of us, um, both in in what you've been teaching, but also in the work you're doing. Um, so I have I have a really kind of basic question that I'm wondering about, and and it harkens back to something you had said earlier on about really a lack of good understanding of w where. Um, you know, what we even have in some of the collections that might exist, both public collections and private collections, I'll say, and also uh, what exists, you know, in terms of, I, w I don't know how else to say, it, like historic sites, mm -hmm. but in terms of heritage sites that might exist. Mm -hmm. I know, I, I'm going to say 10 years ago, or maybe it's even longer, maybe it's closer to 20, I know the federal government had funded something with the provinces to try and identify I thought a lot of it was municipal heritage sites yeah. or designating heritage sites, and I know that there was some money that was put into that to try and identify and and uh, cr create statements of significance about 
and, and potentially provide some ongoing protections or maybe use it in the future to try and protect certain sites. I don't know enough about that whole process that the, you know, or funding that, that came from the feds but I think was administered provincially and whether or not there was um, attention or specific attention paid to indigenous heritage sites or whether there was any cooperation with any of the First Nations or, or um, Métis organizations to, to be part of that funding or to, to work with the provincial government in identifying any of that. I don't know if you know about that, but yeah. Thanks for thanks for your comments and your questions. Um, first, to speak to the issue of um, provenance and the difficulty of attributing provenance. Uh, this is why we need um, some time and some resources also to go to institutions. Right, they are spread really thin right now, and uh, they need the resources as well as to work with the First Nations communities and the Métis communities and the Inuit communities to come in and to help identify what some of these resources are. What we were talking about a lot at the conference and what we've talked about a lot over a number of years is the importance of digitizing collections, which will really help with that process. So there is funding that people are trying to get right now uh, to digitize. Now that will be done in a way that is respectful of First Nations laws in terms of who can access to see what. But um, getting everything digitized and having transparent policies is really uh, the first place to start uh, to, get this, to get this going. Um, we also uh, are talking about cost scoping. So in British Columbia right now, um, I'm also involved overseeing a project which is a repatriation cost and scoping project, which is actually focused on communities and what their needs are to build capacity, to do the research, to find out what's in the different collections, to make those visits, um, to properly implement protocols, uh, to bring ancestors and belongings home, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter what we do in terms of policy or legislation, it's useless without a funding mechanism to support some of these initiatives. And in some places we have more commitment to that and in some other places we don't. And I'm really glad that you raised municipalities because as you know, across the country there are different levels of commitment to implementing the declaration. But many municipalities have made that commitment such as the city of Saskatoon. And I know the Remi Gallery has as well. And these folks will collaborate in terms of some of the allocation of funding to move some of these projects forward. With respect to the comment you made about um, the designation of sites and the lists of sites, uh, we are working on that. There has been some First Nation engagement. One of the good things about the bill that I mentioned, uh, Bill C, got there by so many numbers, 32, <laughs> I think it was, the Historic Property Act, um, that bill uh, is going to enable the designation of sites that might not fit under the conventional historic significance, but are of significance to indigenous peoples. That will allow them to be put on a heritage list. Now what that does is make it more difficult to get those development permits and easier to get that funding. So th those are some responses to your, your comment, your question. You're welcome. I think that's the only question that we have there. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I, I work in the area of repatriation and cultural rights as well, which is how I know Professor Bell. Um, but I put in an ethics exemption to ask, um, to, do, to, to do a survey with um, holding institutions in Canada. We put out a survey to 71 institutions, got back 21 responses. However, um, the ethics board here at, in Saskatchewan said that it would be too triggering and too vulnerable for Aboriginals to actually know if they actually, um, how many individuals they had and where they would have come from. So um, it's difficult to get that information. It's even difficult underneath the US law to get that information. And a lot of times it does place that burden and that onus on the First Nations to do so. Um, so I know for myself, one of the ways I'm trying to rectify it, as well as with that, is to help create um, First Nations um, individualized repatriation processes. Because for far too long, First Nations themselves have had to um, comply with 10 provinces and federal. 
Well, especially if the Quebec reference case goes through, we can switch that and actually make it then the not just indigenized, but Muskeg Lake eyes, star blanket eyes, right? That's where I think we can get the most part for reconciliation and try and, and actually fulfill those TRCs. So um, again, I would like to thank McKercher and Catherine Bell, and uh, Nisha is as a student rep to come here and give you a small, very small token of how much we appreciated you. And I just say yay yay to everything Jamie just said. I support all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nisha. And it's really been a pleasure working with Nisha, who is in my class and one of our volunteers at the workshop. Thank you very much.